Hello creative friends, welcome to this much anticipated video about how to price your stationary products or art prints or whatever you're making that is usually paper. That's sort of my thing, but this will apply to basically anything you're making and selling in your art or creative business. Pricing is really hard, especially when you're getting started. This is a little bit of a different video for me because this is sort of like, welcome to Professor Rebecca's class on business stuff. Uh, that doesn't sound very professional, but I actually was a professor. I taught at a university before uh, I ran this business. So I do have teaching experience <laughs> and business experience. So if we haven't met before, hello, uh, my name is Rebecca and I run Lucky Spurt Studio. It is an art studio based here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I make cute things and illustrations and just generally be adorable. Or at least I try. <laughs> I have made probably the longest note on my phone with all my notes on this lesson. So if you see me glance down, it's just because I wanna get things right for you guys. But pricing is hard for your business. Like it's, it's a challenge, especially when you're getting started and you don't know what you're doing. So this is going to be hopefully a very informative video. It is gonna be kind of a technical video, but I think I've broken it down into really easy to follow stuff so don't be intimidated but if you, this is also like a little bit more of like a serious topic so maybe like grab some paper and a pen if you want to make notes on how to calculate your product prices okay let's just get into it the better that you understand like your product and the market and your business it's going to become easier to understand how to price your products but you're going to see that actually doing these formulas will help you figure out when you improve your efficiency down the road you can make more money and that is really cool to see how that actually works like on paper also everything i'm going to be talking about is in canadian dollars because i'm canadian and that's the money i have <laughs> but uh it's very easily transferable to us dollars the same principles or it's the same, the same idea, no matter what your money is. I'm just using Canadian dollars. So if something sounds really expensive to you, it's probably just because it's Canadian or just as expensive. The easiest way for you to price your items when you're getting started is to use price plus pricing. So there's a lot of different kinds of types of pricing or schools of thought about pricing. I'm gonna talk more about some of those at the end of this video, but I'm gonna be focusing on this one because it is kind of the easiest to figure out, best one to get started with in my opinion, and uh, it, it just makes the most sense. I also call this cost pricing and just for the sake of not stumbling over my words, I had a retainer for like 15 years. So my S's, we're not going to mess with price plus pricing. We're just going to do cost pricing. Okay. That's what I mean. <laughs> the basic formula for this is very simple. And that is why I am so far away from, from the camera right now, because I have room to put text around me. The basic formula is materials plus time equals your base cost. Base cost times two equals your wholesale cost and wholesale cost times two is a retail cost. And if that's all you needed to know, then the video is done here for you. But if you want to understand what all of this means, that is what I'm going to be talking about. So what are these costs? The retail cost is if you are selling at a market, at your online store, or your products are in a store somewhere, that is the price customers are paying for your item. The wholesale cost is going to be the cost that you could sell your item to a retailer or a store for, and then they will double that price for the retail cost. So they want to make their money on that markup. And then the base cost is just what does it cost you in terms of time and materials to make this product. And just remember when you are running a handmade business, you are actually running two businesses. You are running a manufacturing business and you're running a retail business. And those two are like quite big different jobs. So we're going to make sure that you get paid for both of them using these formulas. And this whole method of pricing is really useful because not only do you get paid back for the time and materials that you spent making it, but you're also making a profit. And we love profit. Profit is just money that isn't the direct compensation for your time and labor. It's the money above and beyond that. And that is the money that is going to help your business grow. That's gonna help you pay for new equipment and upgrades. It's gonna help you with your business expenses and fees and all the other nonsense that goes into running something like this. It's also going to help pay your salary or basically just whatever money you get out of it. Because you probably are running this business because you wanna make more money than just what you get hourly for manufacturing something, right? Now there is a lot of ways to formalize where all that money goes from your profit and what you do with it in order to grow your business, but that is a bit more advanced. And I think that most people I'm speaking to here are either just starting their business for the first time or running something that's kind of small or a micro business. So we're not gonna worry too much about how to distribute that profit. We're just gonna figure out how to price your items and then you can grow with it. I feel like 
there are some mysteries in running a business that you can't really just be told. It's best to just learn it. Um, maybe I'm wrong. That's okay. I could be wrong about that. But that's been my experience. And it's easier sometimes to make some uh, choices and then just see how they play out rather than just be told you need to put this much of your money in this pile and this much in that pile. It's going to really vary for you. But I will say the important thing to do at this point is first get your pricing right. And that's what we're doing today. So you're already on top of that. Then you need to track your expenses. So everything you're spending on your business, you need to log your hours. So you know how many hours you are working. And of course, keep track of your sales. When you have all that data tracked, those three key things, then you can figure everything out uh, and have stuff to look back at and figure out like, oh, I was spending way too much on this and not enough on this, or uh, I'm definitely not getting paid. These are the most common problems. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a small maker or artist or business owner who's been like, wow, I'm making too much money. I should be earning less. <laughs> it's usually the other way. Okay, so we talked about that formula. We are going to break down everything that goes into that step by step, little piece by little piece, penny by penny to help you figure out how to price your items. So first, we're going to figure out what your material costs are and your labor costs to figure out that base cost. Okay, I had to run around and get some things. So the product that we are going to be using as our example is a notepad. And that's because most people probably know me from my notepad DIY video, uh, but this is gonna work for any type of product, art print, greeting cards, uh, other, I don't know, that's just what I sell, but whatever you sell. So uh, this is gonna be our example product for today. This is a notepad. It's actually bigger than the one I meant to grab. The ones that I normally sell, they're like a quarter of a sheet of paper, um, but I don't have any finish. So this is what size they are. And this is what they look like when they're finished, packaged up. This is just a little bit of a bigger one. So forgive me, the prices I'm quoting as our example is for the smaller version, but I'm just gonna hold one so we have a point of reference. So material costs of a product. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is figure out what are all the things that go into making your item. So we're not talking about like the design process here. We're talking about the thing that goes in the customer's hand like that I'm holding, what are all the pieces that go into this? So for a notepad, we have paper, the backing cardboard, uh, the ink that I print, because I print all my designs at home. We have the glue that binds it at the top and the little sleeve that it lives in for packaging. So those are all the materials. We have to figure out how much this specific one item costs to make using all those materials to figure out half of that base cost. This can be kind of easy for some items and hard for others. It's easy for things that you can just find a receipt from the store you bought them from and do the math off of that. It's hard for things like glue to calculate like how much glue does one actually use. So I'm gonna talk you through this as our example, but I covered a lot of, that's a lot of different materials that you might encounter. So material number one is paper. The paper I buy, I get, for, the, for my notepads, I use a 28 pound paper, which is a little heavier than a printer paper and I get 500 sheets of paper in a brick for $25. So that means that $25 divided by 500, each sheet of paper is five cents. So let's say I'm using 15 sheets of paper to make a notepad. Um, it'll depend on how thick your notepad is, the page number doesn't really matter. But for the sake of our example, that is going to be 15 sheets times five cents each, 75 cents in paper for one product. Cool, I was just editing this video and realized that 10 minutes in the middle of it had no audio. So we're gonna try again. Um, so take two of finishing this section. <laughs> okay, so first with the paper, the next part of making this is the backing. And this is just a brown chipboard, um, like you would find on any big basic notepad at a store. Uh, I buy it from the art supply store in sheets of four by five feet. Uh, but you can also buy chipboard, is what it's called, uh, just about anywhere in smaller sizes as well. Um, Uline has it, uh, you can get it online, paper supplies, or office supplies. So the big sheets that I buy are $6 each, and when I did the math on it, I can get at minimum uh, like 100 backings for the smaller size notepads from one of those sheets. So $6 divided by 100, that means that the backing is $0.06 cents per notepad. Next we have the ink, and I print all my notepads at home on my Epson printer. I have an Epson EcoTank 2400. I think that's an older model now. They're maybe phasing it up to higher numbers. I think the 2800 is very comparable, um, and I love it. Uh, it's not great for thicker paper, but I think the print quality is great, and the ink usage is great. So how do we calculate ink use on a printer? Uh, there is actually a way to do this. And this number is going to vary wildly based on your printer. An EcoTank printer like I have has a ton of ink in it versus an inkjet printer with just the little cartridges uh, may not go as far. 
So this is an example of where your materials and your equipment can impact the cost. The way to calculate how much the ink costs is how much does your ink cartridge cost? For me, uh, it's $80 to get all four bottles, which is black, yellow, cyan, and magenta to put in my printer. So $80 is the cost. And my printer, you can just look up the specs of your printer and it will tell you how many approximate pages it could make per refill. And my printer says 7,500 color pages per refill. So that, then I can do the math, 80 divided by 7,500, which is basically one cent per sheet. And like I said, 15 sheets in this design, then that is going to be 15 cents for the ink cost. Next, we have the glue. So that's the glue binding at the very top of the notepad. If you've seen my tutorials, you know how I make them with just a little bit of glue. Uh, the, that's one of those things like paint that is harder to calculate. Uh, but basically, we're just going to roughly guess how many at minimum we could make of the thing using that product. So for glue, it's a $15 bottle that I use. And I'm going to guess at least 300 notepads out of one of those bottles uh, because it's not very much glue. And that's definitely a conservative estimate, but that's the way you should be approaching these things. So $15 divided by 300, that means I'm adding five cents for the glue. Last is the plastic sleeve. Now I package all of my paper goods in these little sleeves because I sell a lot at art markets and it's very dangerous to your inventory to be selling at in-person markets, not in little sleeves, unfortunately. I wish that weren't the case, but that's just how it goes. So the little sleeve, I buy these in bulk in a variety of sizes. Uh, you can get them from suppliers. You can also get them off Amazon, but again, the more you can buy, the cheaper they'll be. So I get these sleeves for about 10 cents each. So that brings our total for one notepad the total materials cost is $1.11. Now, the great thing about that is you can see that anywhere I can improve the efficiency of my materials, I can lower that cost and put more money in my pocket. For example, an easy one would be the paper. So right now, 500 sheets for $25. Uh, the more I can buy typically from a supplier, the cheaper the paper will be. So if I was able to buy more, that material cost would go down significantly. However, if you're a small business doing this, the thing to keep in mind is that buying more means you need more money up front to invest and also someplace to store it. And those can be two troubles that a lot of small business owners don't have right off the start. So improving your material costs can be something to work towards over time. And also in this case, I'm calculating making something by hand. Uh, you can definitely have things manufactured and you can factor the cost of goods the same way, but they're just manufactured elsewhere. Okay, so those are our material costs. Now let's look at our time and labor costs. So generally when we're talking about time and labor in uh, manufacturing like this, we're talking about a lot of different things. So there is the time designing or illustrating the product. There is the time actually doing the gluing and the cutting and the putting it together. There's the packaging, there is the administrative time, and there's all sorts of other things that can be factored in. And I like to divide these into two categories just to make it easier to understand. There are our fixed time investments and our ongoing time investments. The fixed time investments are things that you have to do once. So that's designing, uh, illustrating, anything that goes into making the product, but you only have to do it one time. And the ongoing inv time investments are things you have to do all the time, like the manufacturing process. So let's calculate both of these and see how they work. The first thing you have to do is actually figure out what your hourly wage is. So this is going to be the amount that you think that you should be paid for your work. Um, I can't really tell you what that should be because it's going to vary depending on where you live, what your lifestyle is like, how much money you actually need, what your currency is, uh, what your level of expertise is. All of that varies. I can't really tell you that, but you have to decide that for yourself. Um, if you don't know, find out what the minimum wage in your area is and add some to it because I, I think minimum wage is usually way too low. Um, I'm going to use for our example $20. Canadian, keep in mind, which is um, above minimum wage here, but still below the cost of living. So it's just an example because <laughs> working with a round number is easy when I'm trying to teach something. So with $20 as our hourly wage, let's look at the fixed time investments first. Again, those are going to be designing, illustrating, painting, planning, whatever you do one time. What you have to do is figure out how many hours that took you. So in the case of this notepad, like this design right here, this is a very simple one. It's just graphic. It's not like an illustration per se. So this actually took me maybe half an hour to design. Um, now, keep in mind the time it takes does not directly correlate to the quality. I think this is really cute and it turned out really nice. And I'm also really good at what I do. So it doesn't take me super long. But uh, so this actually only took about half an hour. Something you're making could take multiple hours. You could be knitting a sweater. You could be 
sculpting a mug, or you could be uh, drawing a picture that you sell as art prints. Whatever the task is, just figure out how many hours that task takes. I did use examples like pottery and sweaters. I'm talking, uh, the actual making of that is in the next category. I'm talking about like the planning, the designing, that kind of stuff, which all is relevant to all art forms. I'm rambling, let me get back on track. Okay, my example took 30 minutes to make the design. That's the fixed time. I'm paying myself $20 an hour. That's half an hour. So $10 is the fixed time investment for this piece. So how do you put that into the cost of the product? That's a little bit tricky. Lots of different schools have thought about how you could do that, but here's how I do it and I recommend doing it, is that you need to figure out a minimum feasible number of this product that you are going to sell. So again, always be on the conservative side, but for example, I might have a store update coming soon and I know that people buy things when I do a store update. And a new notepad, I can conservatively estimate I will sell maybe 100 of that product. So with that in mind, 100 is now the number that I'm going to distribute that $10 amongst. And once I have sold more than 100, then I'm making just a little more profit, which is a good thing. $10 divided by 100 products, that is 10 cents per product. Therefore, I will add 10 cents for my fixed time assets added to the labor cost in the product. Does that make sense? I hope so. So that's the first half of our time and labor calculations in order to make the base cost of your product. Next, we'll look at the ongoing time investments, which is typically manufacturing. Wow, that sun got really bright all of a sudden. Is there a cloud coming? I think so. Okay, we're just gonna bear with it. So the making of the product, that's the cutting, the gluing, the clamping, whatever you do for a notepad, or whatever you do to make your product. That could be printing and cutting and putting in a bag. It's just getting brighter and brighter. All right, I'm just gonna lean slightly. If your product is like an art print, that could just be printing, putting in a bag. This cost of manufacturing could be super, super low. But if you're hand making something, uh, that can take longer. So with the notepad, I can make maybe, if I'm really focused, about 20 an hour of the handmade ones. But if you're making like a mug or a sweater, that could be five hours or 20 hours or something much bigger. So obviously the time invest, the ongoing time investment of your time you actually spent making it can vary wildly depending on your product. So um, that's gonna be a big variable here. But from the notepad example, if I can make 20 in one hour and I've decided that I'm getting paid $20 an hour, then that is $1 per notepad. So adding those together, the fixed time investment with the ongoing time investment, 10 cents plus a dollar, a dollar 10 is our labor cost. So that means our total cost for making our product, the base cost is going to be $1.11 in materials plus $1.10 in time, coming to a total of $2.21 Canadian. <laughs> now, little star, asterisk. This is the cost that I'm doing for the notepads of doing it by hand. I am making this by hand. So it's much more time intensive and cost intensive. Another option is to have someone else manufacture it for you. Uh, notepads in particular are um, a product that can be easily manufactured by a machine, slowly made by a human being. So if you are reaching the point where you wanna outsource, you can use the cost that we just calculated to compare against uh, the cost per unit that a manufacturer could get you. And having products manufactured can save you both a lot of time, obviously you're not making things by hand, they could also save you money because there's no way that I as an individual could have the low cost of materials that a manufacturing company could do. But for a lot of small makers, the point isn't to have it manufactured, it's about making things by hand. So adding the manufacturing goal or whatever into your plan for your business isn't necessary at all. I'm just mentioning it because some people, the priority is about making things by hand. For other people, it's about getting their illustrations or their artwork out there on products and making it by hand is a good interim solution when you're just getting started and don't have a lot of money to invest. Or you just like making notepads, that is possible too. All right, so moving on to our next and last, second last section, wholesale cost and retail cost. So we now know that our product, our product costs us $2.21 to make. For the sake of round numbers, I'm going to round this up to 225, and you can also round your products up to a near reasonable number. You don't have to keep it at a weird number like that. So let's say 225 is our cost that we're going with as our base cost. The wholesale cost of your product is going to be that number times two. And then the retail cost of that, which the customer is gonna pay at the end of the day, is the wholesale cost times two again. So in this case, the notepad would wholesale for $4.50 and it would retail for $9. And if that sounds kind of high to you, it, 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 in my opinion, it is. So hold on, we're gonna to get to that. 
I always recommend people consider wholesale pricing even right from the beginning because you don't know a year from now if you're gonna have grown this business to a point where you wanna wholesale and your items just aren't priced or your customers have come to expect your items at a price that just doesn't make you any money if you're gonna wholesale it. So starting with the wholesale mindset from the beginning, even if you're not sure you wanna do that, uh, I think is really smart. And if you have no experience with this, then just know that a store, let's say there's like, um, I have some of my products at like a local stationery store, they will buy the items from me for 50% of the retail cost. So if a product is gonna be $10, they will buy it for $5 from me. And that's generally true at most stores. They, the wholesale cost is 50% of the retail. Probably I've said that enough times, but I'm just trying to make it really clear because I know I'm just saying numbers at you. And we don't wholesale for just the base cost, that 225. We don't wholesale at that price because at that point you're just getting paid to make something. You're not actually running a business. Businesses have profit and you need that profit to run. Like we already said, you need it to pay yourself, to invest in your business, to grow, blah, blah, blah. All sorts of good stuff. So you can't sell wholesale for just your base cost. Remember that. Okay, so that all sounds well and good, but the problem that you may have identified with the numbers I said above, wholesaling this notepad for four, 50 and retail for nine, is that those numbers seem above the market of what is reasonable for this type of item. Based on my research, a notepad, well this, again, this is if this is a smaller one, people are expecting like $6 Canadian again. So maybe that's close to like 475-ish US, not totally sure right now. But yeah, so like $6 is kind of what I would expect to pay for a notepad of the smaller size. So if we were going to go with that and reverse engineer it, that means that we are wholesaling that notepad for $3 and uh, then whatever it comes out of that is our profit. Now that doesn't really work with these handmade notepads because with my base cost of $2.21 in reality, then if I was wholesaling for $3, that means that my profit is only 79 cents. And personally, that is not worth it. That is too small of a profit margin because in order to make that worthwhile, you would have to scale. And that means you'd have to wholesale tons of them to make a good amount of money. And that means I would have to hand make tons of them and I just don't have the time to be making that many notepads to make that amount of money. So that actually indicates that this product as a handmade thing is not a good contender for wholesaling. And that's why I don't wholesale it. I only sell my handmade notepads directly to customers on my online store or at market events. And that means that I am actually getting the retail cost, the $6, which is generally what I sell the smaller ones for right now, uh, which means that I'm getting $3.79 profit on top of the base cost. And that amount of money for me makes it worthwhile to do. And I choose to wholesale other products from my product line like greeting cards, where the numbers make a bit more sense. But as you can see, it's really a matter of scale when it comes down to pricing and choosing to wholesale. If I was getting these notepads manufactured and could get the cost down to below a dollar per unit at least, and you can definitely get them even lower, just a matter of like, can I order 2000 of them? But even if I did get them made for a dollar per unit, then that would mean that my wholesale price of $3, I'd be getting $2 as profit on top of that. And that feels much more reasonable. So I would only really consider wholesaling notepads if I was getting them manufactured in bulk for a really good price. And in order to do that, I need to have a certain amount of money I can invest in my business and also confidence that I'm ordering something people are gonna want something that is tested. So that's why I think it's great to start off as a handmade business because you can test and find out what designs people really like. And then when you are sure that like everybody loves my bumblebee design or whatever, that's one you can invest in and buy a lot of um, inventory for. And also this is just generally why some handmade items work well as wholesale products and some don't. Sometimes things are just so expensive to make like hand knitting a sweater, uh, which I think is my benchmark for the most laborious process of any handmade item. I could be wrong, there could be even more laborious things. Like the cost that it would take, you couldn't put it in, I guess you would have to put it in like a designer store because it would be in the price range of more designer items than they would be. So that's, you know, there's a way to do everything, but we are talking about really small starting things. So yes. Anyways, that is the basics of how to price a handmade item, specifically a stationary item, but you can, like, you can probably see how that applies to a lot of different things. And like I said, this is technically price plus pricing, which I call cost pricing, but price plus. But there are other kinds of pricing too. And two that might be relevant to you to hear is number one, competitive pricing, or what I would call market pricing also. And that's basically, maybe you do all this math and you figure out like, okay, well, if I do this, then my product costs this. But everyone else in my market is selling this product for this price. 
This can happen a lot with art prints because depending on how you calculate your time and labor, I mean, you know, an art print could be, you know, $2 in materials and whatever you price out for your labor and such. And as soon as you start to double that, you might get a final cost of like under $10. And you don't sell art prints for under $10. They're worth more than that. They're at least 20 usually. So in that case, you have to look at the market and not be the only person at the show, the art show, selling art prints for $10 when everyone else sells them for 20. Uh, you're not going to make a lot of friends and people are going to wonder why yours are so cheap when they expect the price to be a little bit higher. So market pricing, you can look at your competitors and see if your price, especially after you do all that mathy math, if your price is kind of similar to what theirs are. Another price strategy that you could consider is prestige pricing. And this is basically when you are famous or have a popular brand and can charge more for your stuff. This is what designer brands do all the time. But this is relevant to artists because if you become a famous artist or just in demand or popular online or whatever, when your stuff is more popular, there's more demand for it. You may be able to do smaller print runs or small batches of things and charge more money for them because you know they will sell just based on the popularity versus the actual value of the materials itself. So that's a little bit of a different situation, but prestige pricing can be useful down the road. All right, I'm putting down the phone, no more notes. That is it. I hope that was helpful and interesting and not too boring. Um, I know this is one of those business topics that can be kind of snooze fest, but uh, it is important and you kind of only have to figure it out once and then just reassess over time rather than just realize that the curtain rod is missing a thing on the end. Where did that go? I'm gonna have to worry about that later. Um, what was I saying? Pricing. Hope you hope that helped. <laughs> I'm so distractible sitting here. There's two big windows, so there's just like stuff happening in the world outside. Uh, okay, let's wrap this up. If you have any questions about what we talked about, uh, I will do my best to answer. If it gets really complicated, I might defer. No, that's not right to say. I'll do my best to answer the questions you have, but I hope I answered all of them because I think that was really thorough. I think I was very thorough in that in this lesson. Uh, forgive my messy art space. I say that in like every video behind, there's always a mess behind me, but I've made really big progress in organizing my studio. Um, you probably can't tell from this perspective, but this wall of bookshelves right here, looking really good so far. And I'm gonna film a studio tour once it's all done. If you're watching at the end, then I don't really know what to say other than like, oh, thanks so much for watching to the end. It means a lot. I love working on my YouTube channel and I try and put together useful videos, but sometimes it takes a long time because like a video like this was so technical and I wanted to put it together in a way that it made sense and was relevant to you guys. And that's why it took so long because I've, I've literally rewritten the whole script for this like three times and changed it. I'm like, this is too confusing. They're not gonna, it's gonna be boring and they're not gonna care. Um, so I hope that this was a good one. Let me know, I want, uh, if you're watching it to the end, give me some feedback or just give me a compliment because I'm, I'm <laughs> it was a lot of talking and I'm kind of tired and I, I can use a compliment. I have to stop. All right, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you wanna hang out with me more via videos because I am here and I'm working on more videos. All right, love you lots. Thank you for watching. I'll see you later. Bye.